Welcome back, friends. Andrew Benson Brown here. I have been absent for a while, ever since I did an episode on Torcado Tasso back in November, so I apologize for that, but now I'm back. I have been focusing more on making poetry videos to help grow my YouTube channel. If you follow me, you may have seen some of those. I have now made more than 100 short videos in my shorts feed, and a handful of more long-form videos as well. Occasionally my own, but mostly reading the poetry of others, and visualized in an engaging way that I don't think anyone else is quite doing today. At least for classical poetry. And I have recently passed the mark of 250 subscribers, so I'd like to say thank you for all of my supporters. I know that 250 is not a lot, but I think given the nature of what I'm doing, classical poetry having become something of a boutique art these days, it's a fairly respectable number. And of course, with every small gain, we inch ever closer to our goal of world poetical domination. Now, since I've been uploading all these videos, I've been getting a lot of random comments. And my personal favorites are the angry ones. Lake Monster 8645 wrote in a comment on my Tasso episode, why can't people just talk about poetry? Why do you have to inject your they can't write something like this now comments? Just talk about the poem and the culture with a veneer of objectivity and keep your politics to yourself. Well, sorry, Lake Monster, that's not going to happen. It's very obvious that you were offended, and I would be willing to bet that if I were talking about your sort of politics, you wouldn't mind at all. Now, regarding the particulars of Tasso himself, the waning of his reputation is heavily intertwined with shifts in cultural values, largely anti-Western values. But beyond that, more generally, nobody in the poetry world today seems to be willing to openly discuss the politicization that has occurred in the mainstream institutions, across the pobiz, and the radical takeover of almost every mainstream poetry journal. It's a serious problem with much wider ramifications than the average person realizes. It needs to be addressed so that it can be reversed. And my other favorite comment is from Sam P, or Samp759? In my short video I made of a scene from James Sale's epic poem, Hellward, about John Lennon going to hell, Sam P says, What the hell, man? Incredibly disrespectful! Well, yes. Yes, it was, Sam P. That was precisely the point. That is the intended effect when you place John Lennon in hell to be tormented for all of eternity. The man was a complete fraud, and he needs to be exposed for what he is. Now, since I haven't been on for a while, there's a lot to talk about. I'm going to be interviewing Brian Yapko later on, the winner of the 2023 Society of Classical Poets International Competition, a master of verse craft, so I'm very excited to be talking with him. But first, it's time for some shameless self-advertising. The second volume of my mock epic poem, Legends of Liberty, is now available to order on Amazon. It's been almost three years since I published my first volume. And of course, if you haven't read that yet, then you need to get a copy of that as well. In the first volume, we met Thomas Jefferson in Hell, Paul Revere on his Midnight Ride, and the combatants at Lexington and Concord. And now the second volume continues with that story and mixes in some more familiar characters like Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and George III. If you think you know the story of the American Revolution, think again, because I'm just making a lot of stuff up. Why? because history is more fun that way. Of course, I remain true to the actual events in spirit. And if you look at my redesigned cover art, you'll get a pretty good idea of the sort of thing that you're in store for. It's available in paperback format or Kindle, so click the link in the description and check it out. So it's been three or four months since I've done an episode, and I have an awful lot to rant about. And I would like to begin by telling a personal story. When I was in high school, if you would have told me that I would go on to take up poetry as a vocation, I would have laughed in your face. I wasn't really interested in reading or literature, except for the few Shakespeare plays I had to read. Partly I think this had to do with the standard high school curriculum, stuff like To Kill a Mockingbird that falls into the category George Orwell once described as good-bad books, more notable for their perceived social value than their actual literary quality. But when I was in ninth grade, I read Samuel Butler's prose translation of The Odyssey. We also watched the made-for-TV film version starring Armand Asante, which had just come out. And it was amazing. Odysseus was a guy to envy. He fights monsters and sleeps with goddesses. Then, when he makes it home, he kills all the traitors who tried to steal his wife, whom he remained faithful to, at least in spirit. He was just awesome. The Odyssey was completely unlike all the other boring books I had to read up to that point. And it helped that I had a really great English teacher, Mr. Jones, who brought the material alive. 
And that was the moment that I fell in love with Epic. I've read a bunch of translations since then. My personal favorite is probably George Chapman's, which is the first English language translation. It's not as accurate, and mostly he's remembered today for being mentioned in a Keats poem, but I'm just a sucker for everything from the Elizabethan period, and I love Chapman's lush language. Of course, I also like the top 20th century translations, Robert Fagel's, Lattimore, and Fitzgerald. So when I heard about a new translation from Emily Wilson, I got excited. Everyone was talking about it. Although it was brand new, it was already quickly replacing Fagel's translation, which had been standard in most curricula since the 90s. So I got a copy and dived into it, and my gut reaction was pretty disappointing. Stylistically, the best way to describe Wilson's translation is, if Shakespeare's plays were rewritten by Ernest Hemingway, it transforms Homer's deliberately archaic dialect into a dull minimalism. I know that the literary trends today favor dumbing everything down, were basically the antithesis of the Elizabethan period, but I was still hoping for something more. I do like a few things about it, I like that it's in iambic pentameter. Wilson also varies the rote repetitions that occur in Homer. Uh, because they were oral poems, there's a lot of redundancy. And Wilson changes her wording of Homer's rosy-fingered dawn phrase a lot. Now, this isn't really accurate, but for a modern reading audience, it does make for an interesting variety. Now, in two of my more recent long-form videos, I read excerpts of another new translation of the Odyssey by Mike Solit. It's an excellent translation in dactylic pentameter, or maybe anapestic pentameter. It's a bit loose metrically, so there's not much of a meaningful distinction between dactyls and anapests here. The pentameter feels more right for English than hexameter, which is just a little too long. Solit's translation is readable and modern, without straying into the extremes of dumbed-down minimalism like Wilson's does. The main issue in Wilson's case isn't stylistic. Wilson's is the first translation done by a woman, which is great and all. But there is also an agenda behind it. In the introduction, Wilson tells us that Odysseus's behavior is problematic. He is, quote, a liar, pirate, colonizer, deceiver, and thief, who is so often in disguise, absent, or napping, while many other people, those he owns, those he leads, suffer and die, and who directly kills so many people. Yes, Odysseus does a lot of bad things. On his way back home, he sacks a town and kills the inhabitants. He cheats on his wife, albeit against his will. There's that thing with a wooden horse where he tricked the Trojans and sacked their city. In short, Odysseus, as the most influential, cited, and riffed-on character in all of world literature, is the original purveyor of toxic masculinity. And worst of all, Wilson says, is the way Odysseus treats women. After he kills the suitors, he orders Telemachus to kill the slave girls who slept with them. In denouncing this, Wilson seems to display a misplaced and basically unhomeric sympathy for the slave girls, overlooking their foul-mouthed and bawdy behavior. They clearly sided with the bad guys for their own pleasure and gain, and needed to be punished. But Wilson ignores this obvious fact in order to portray them as the victims of an oppressed class. Although late in the poem, Homer describes the unfaithful slave girls consistently and unambiguously as sluts. Wilson refuses to translate these insulting terms. So we can see that not only is Odysseus problematic, Homer himself is problematic in his use of language. Didn't Homer get the memo that prostitutes are sex workers now? Those treacherous and promiscuous slave girls, they're people too, and you need to accept them. And get an OnlyFans account while you're at it so you can support them. Why not? Yes, friends, you need to be doing your part for gender equality. As for other characters, feminist scholars have also pointed out how females in the Odyssey are stereotyped. How they're either seductive and deceptive, or faithful and submissive. So all this begs the question, what if Odysseus wasn't problematic? What if Circe and Penelope were not stereotypes? What kind of story would that be? Well, in line with this thinking, let's reimagine things in a way that considers the feelings of our more enlightened and sensitive modern attitudes. So here, for your edification, I present to you the plot of Woke Odyssey. Meet Odysseus, a super nice guy who's really working hard to better himself, express his feelings, and resolve conflict. After Achilles is killed by Paris at Troy, Odysseus comes up with the idea for the Trojan horse, but then decides against building it, since it would be wrong to deceive the city's inhabitants as to his intentions. So instead, 
he calls for a ceasefire, citing the numerous humanitarian crimes committed against the Greeks and the Trojans' wrongful colonization of Asia Minor. Thankfully, the Trojans agree to pay reparations and favor a two-state solution. Later, when trying to get home, Odysseus makes a stop on the island of the Lotus Eaters and likes what he tastes. He decides to grow the narcotic on a mass scale and distribute it throughout Greece, making sure that the walls of all the city-states are torn down so he doesn't have to deal with the Spartan border patrol. In Book 10 on the island of Circe, Odysseus declines the witch's manipulations and doesn't agree to sleep with her, since this could be construed as rape under the burgeoning Me Too movement spreading through the Aegean. He thus allows the rest of his men to remain pigs, which is of course what they always were anyway, their new form being merely the physical manifestation of their allegorical reality. While visiting the underworld in Book 11, Odysseus uses the proper pronouns when addressing Tiresias. Since the prophet spent seven years as a woman, and even after Hera turned him back into a man, he continues to identify as transgender. In Book 12, when passing by Scylla and Charybdis, Odysseus finds some unborn babies to sacrifice to the six-headed monster, and is allowed to pass. Meanwhile, back home in Ithaca, Penelope is trying to change prevailing attitudes towards slut-shaming by sleeping with all the suitors, then playing their jealousies off against each other. When Odysseus finally returns home, he nicely asks the suitors to leave, since defending his honor could result in him being prosecuted, and he doesn't want his kingship to be defunded. The suitors don't respect his requests and kill him gleefully, then proceed to riot and tear down all the statues of gods on the island, with no consequences for their behavior. Penelope isn't that concerned about her husband's death, since she was wanting to be free of the oppressive confines of marriage anyway. She rules alone reveling in her status as Ithaca's new girl boss and continuing to take a string of lovers, ensuring that there will be no threats to Telemachus' succession by having multiple abortions. She preaches equality for all, while hoarding the island's resources and building numerous villas as the rest of the citizens live in poverty. Thankfully, Penelope more than compensates for her selfish hedonistic lifestyle by promoting diverse representation on the Greek stage, and commissioning women and non-Greek-speaking barbarians to write new tragedies, emphasizing how terribly these marginalized groups have been treated. After years of living it up, Penelope dies of complications from syphilis, and Ithaca is conquered by barbarians. The end. What's interesting is that while Odysseus is being decried as toxic, we are also being bombarded with feminist retellings of Greek myths to do the same thing from the opposite perspective. Novels like Circe by Madeline Miller, Eilish Quinn's Medea, Margaret Atwood's Penelope, Ariadne by Jennifer Saint, A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, the list goes on. The market is completely saturated with these works, and they're huge bestsellers. Ever since the success of Wicked, published back in 1996, we've seen a slew of these reinterpretations that attempt to morally relativize the supposedly stereotypical female characters from classic stories. And in at least some of these cases, like Circe and Medea, the female protagonist is doing some pretty awful things. I mean, Medea actually killed her children, which is way worse than anything Odysseus did. But in these cases, there's no judgment. We're encouraged to sympathize with the characters, to understand the context of why they did what they did, and even to celebrate their actions. Circe is touted as a bold and subversive retelling of the goddess's story by the novel's publisher. In the case of Medea, we're asked to consider whether what happened to her is really the full story, and are ensured that she has been unjustly maligned. We need to hear Medea's side through a fresh lens. In Margaret Atwood's hands, the faithfully submissive Penelope becomes the subtly rebellious and secretly defiant Penelope. Now, while Emily Wilson's work is a translation, not a novel, in some ways hers is also a retelling. The minimalist, inoffensive, perpetually rephrased language is about as far from the real Homer as it's possible to be. Now, let's look at George Chapman's translation of 1616 for just a second. At the beginning of Book 6, Chapman describes Odysseus as the much-sustaining, patient, heavenly man. Compare this with how Wilson begins Book 6. Odysseus had suffered. 
Um, I don't know about you, but I think one of these exercises is a clearly superior mode of expression. Wilson's line is dull and totally banal. Coleridge once said that Chapman's translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey were as Homer would have written if he had lived in Elizabethan England. And he's probably right. There's a Baroque richness to Chapman that kind of mirrors Homer's archaic patchwork of dialects that mixes together language from the Dark and Golden Ages of Ancient Greece. In an introduction to the Wordsworth Classics edition of Chapman's Homer, Jan Parker notes that Homer probably would have enjoyed living in Elizabethan England, that he would have felt at home, and that his works would have been richly and popularly appreciated. The reason for this is that, just as nobody talked like Homer's characters, nobody in Elizabethan England, or anywhere else for that matter, ever talked like they did in the plays popular at the time. The historical characters in Shakespeare's dramas never actually talked like Shakespeare wrote. Uh, There's no evidence Julius Caesar ever said, et tu brute. The real Henry V did give a St. Crispin's Day speech before the Battle of Agincourt, and this is even recorded in Holinshed's Chronicles word for word. When you compare this with Shakespeare's speech, though, Shakespeare's version is way better. Now, Shakespeare did draw on Holinshed to craft his speech, as he drew on Holinshed for many of his other plays. But he zhuzhed it up a lot. It's way more high-flown. The flowery, ennobling language of the Elizabethan period parallels that of Homer. It's not that Shakespeare or Chapman are having their characters speak in an unrealistic way, per se. It's more like their heightened language gives a sense of hyperrealism that I think conveys the spirit of those original events in a better way than everyday speech can. Having Odysseus and Athena and everybody else speak in a very spare contemporary style is not only boring, there's a fundamental falseness to it. Reading Wilson's dialogue, I never experienced a sense of verisimilitude. All of the characters just talk like half-literate 21st century Americans. The blatant hypocrisy of this fashion for cashing in on the works of the past, while simultaneously repudiating them, begs the question. In a world where you're not allowed to portray women as realistic villains, is the corrupt and dishonest literary industry capable of any originality at all? Can it move beyond poisonous resentment to do something genuinely new? I would say no. Moreover, is the modern feminist judgment about classical antiquity even accurate? Well, admittedly, yes, it's true that women in ancient Greece had no rights. Aside from the fragments of a few authors, Sappho being the most famous, very few female voices of that time have been transmitted to us. And in the realm of literature, then as now, male writers often aren't good at writing female characters. But this has less to do with them being male and more to do with them just not being good writers. The fact is, it just isn't true that all of the male authors from classical antiquity portrayed their female characters as stereotypes. Look at Ovid's portrayal of Echo and his version of Echo and Narcissus, or Euripides' Hecuba, Aeschylus' Clytemnestra, Sophocles' Antigone. These are all complex women who were painted with masterstrokes by poets who clearly understood human psychology. I think these classic authors portrayed their women in a much deeper way than modern feminist authors do, who limb their characters in a sympathetic but non-judgmental way. Aeschylus, for example, does encourage us to sympathize with Clytemnestra. Agamemnon sacrificed their daughter Iphigenia as if she were livestock, then he left her in the lurch to go fight a foreign war. The guy's gone for ten years. Do you really expect her to remain faithful after that? But although we sympathize with her and understand her, this does not preclude judging her. She cheated on her husband and killed him. And this is why the Greeks are so great, because they show us that sympathy and moral judgment not only can, but must, go hand in hand. Behind every action, there is a sense of fate. Clytemnestra deserved to die at the hand of her son, Orestes. Aeschylus's Oresteia trilogy is a profound meditation on how the tit-for-tat ethic of revenge gave way to the rule of law as Orestes is absolved from punishment by the fates. Modern feminists, on the other hand, are more or less writing highbrow chiclet rather than memorable literature. Far from telling the full story of these ancient women, they take great stories that were already fully fleshed out and neuter them to feel better about themselves. They're acting a lot more like the women in an Aristophanes comedy than any of the noble, tragic women they purport to be characterizing, transposing their stereotype of the girl boss onto antiquity. They weave fantasies about forging your own destiny when this simply isn't the case, and never was. 
Radicals deny the hard truths of human nature in society for the sake of political correctness, and the result is mediocre fiction written in lackluster prose that will be quickly forgotten, while the original versions of these myths will continue to be read. Because when you separate sympathy from judgment, you flounder in meaninglessness. With the rise of these feminist retellings of myths, we seem to be returning to that primitive tribal revenge ethic that was abolished at the end of the Oresteia trilogy. Resentful groups that were once marginalized are now finding success in a profession that historically had shut them out. But instead of celebrating this victory, the complaints just keep increasing as they flex their newfound dominance. And the radicalized publishing industry is making it harder than ever for straightforwardly traditional stories to see the light of day. Mike Sollett's new translation of the Odyssey is a case in point. His metrical rhythm, neither too loose nor too rigid, captures something of the original Greek while avoiding artificiality and remaining musical to the English ear. Since the natural flow of the pentameter fluctuates between anapests and dactyls, I was talking with Mike about exactly what to call this. But no word seems to exist for a higher category of meter that encapsulates the shared traits of both the anapest and the dactyl. If such a term does exist, or if you are a philologically inclined person who wants to invent this term, please let me know what it is. I cannot emphasize enough how vastly superior Solit's translation is to Wilson's. His choice of diction is more objective, and there's no political agenda, whether conservative or liberal. Solit doesn't shame Odysseus, but he doesn't glorify him either, like Fitzgerald's translation often seemed to do. Solit's translation is still a work in progress, it's not available to purchase yet, and herein lies the problem. Mike confided to me that until I started making videos of his work, he had started to lose steam on the project, worried that no one would care. My reading of his translated section of books 21 and 22 of the Odyssey now has over 35,000 views on YouTube, and I'm hoping this will help his work gain more traction and exposure so he can eventually attract a publisher. My more recent second reading of the opening of book one, titled Odysseus Lost at Sea, hasn't performed as well and only has a few hundred views at this point. Which is frustrating because it's the most visually sophisticated reading I've done yet and the beginning of the poem isn't any less compelling than the climax. But because I'm not a big channel, I'm still at the mercy of YouTube's fickle algorithm. So if any of you listening could please watch it, like, leave a comment, that would really help the algorithm push the video out to new viewers and help Mike's translation to gain more exposure. It's probably in vain to think that Wilson's translation can be overthrown at this point given how entrenched it's become in academia just within a few years, but it really needs to be. I like the idea of women translating classic works, but not at the expense of intellectual honesty. So this has been a mostly glass half empty episode where I'm just trashing other authors, but I wanted to focus for a moment on another contemporary novelist who is retelling Odysseus' story in a much more interesting way than any of these other writers. And this is Laura Jenkinson Brown's ongoing project, You Are Odysseus. It's a choose your own path book. I used to love these when I was a kid, but for those who aren't familiar, this is how it works in Jenkinson Brown's words. You read a numbered section, starting at 1, and then you are given choices for how the story should proceed. And depending on your choice, you go to a specific numbered section of text in the book, and then another, and another, until you win, or probably die. I like this approach because Jenkinson Brown doesn't wag her finger at you like Wilson and these other novelists do, telling you in neo-Puritan fashion how bad Odysseus is, and imposing our modern sensibilities on someone from 3,000 years ago. Jenkinson Brown lets you make the same choices Odysseus makes on his journey, and lets you decide for yourself whether what he did was justifiable or not. Uh, the variety of possibilities is really incredible. You might go with Menelaus to Egypt instead, she says, or stay with the Phaeacians, or remove yourself from your own story entirely, or just die in a number of interesting ways you weren't expecting, or get others killed instead of you. And of course, just like in real life, there are consequences for all of your actions. This way of doing things helps you to really understand the choices that Odysseus makes. On Jenkinson Brown's website, she says that the game book currently has 530 sections and is actually longer than the poem itself. It's still a work in progress, so like Solace translation, it's not available yet. 
But you, are Odysseus, is an example of a woman who is contributing something unique to the literary landscape, as opposed to just jumping on the angry feminist bandwagon and doing the same male bashing thing everybody else is doing. It's a great example of a work of contemporary literature that surprisingly doesn't suck.